you, my friend. And uh, yeah, so we're going to be uh, looking this morning at uh, a bunch of encounters that Jesus had with people with disabilities and additional needs, the things that, that he did and said, uh, what those encounters were like, uh, and, uh, and within that, some surprises, some things that uh, maybe stood out as being unusual about those encounters. Uh, and in each case, uh, there's, a, there's a word or a little short phrase uh, that maybe we can pick up on a little bit more as well. I'm hoping there's going to be some things appearing on the, the screen. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. So we're going to be looking at the things that, that Jesus said and did as he encountered those people. Now, we've got five of them to look at this morning. And as we think about these, uh, each of them will appear up on the screen and there'll be a verse there for you to follow if you want to in your Bibles as well. I'll paraphrase the story uh, as we go through looking at each one of them, but by all means do follow them uh, in your Bibles as well. Now, Jesus is recorded in the Bible as, uh, as, as performing 37 uh, separate miracles. John, of course, tells us that if all the things that Jesus did were written down, then all the books in the world uh, wouldn't be enough to contain it all. So we're sure that he did much more than that. But of the 37 miracles that are written down in the Bible, about two-thirds of them relate to people um, who had a disability or an illness of some kind. Um, so it's a really important part of what Jesus' ministry uh, on earth was all about. And if we're thinking about those different encounters that Jesus had with people with uh, disabilities and additional needs, probably the one that comes to mind first of all, and the first one that we're going to have a look at this morning, uh, is uh, when uh, some people brought their friend to meet Jesus, uh, who was preaching and teaching in a house. Uh, and Jesus had been going around preaching and teaching and healing people, uh, and he was preaching and teaching in this house, and loads of people had gathered together to listen to what Jesus had to say. And, and we know that the, the friends of a man who couldn't walk wanted to bring him, and, and they wanted to come themselves uh, to meet Jesus and to bring their friend to him. And when they got there, they couldn't get in. The place was so packed full of people that they couldn't get through the door. Wouldn't that be amazing, especially, you know, at, at this time, maybe we don't know when we're going to be able to all meet as God's people in church again. But it's great to see so many people here uh, today. But imagine if, if it was so packed uh, that people couldn't get into the door. And that's what was happening uh, as Jesus was preaching and teaching on this occasion. And so the friends uh, didn't give up. They found another way. And they clambered up onto the roof and they started to, to open it up and to, to lower their friend down. Can you imagine if that was happening here now? I don't know who's responsible for building and maintenance and insurance and those sorts of things here, but you'd be getting quite worried if suddenly all the roofs started to open up uh, and somebody was being lowered down through. But so, soon enough, this, this man was lowered down through and, and was there in front of Jesus. And that's where two really significant things happen. First of all, there's the surprise. Because it's a bit of a surprise what's going on. But um, Jesus, uh, well, whilst all this is happening, um, doesn't get cross with this disturbance. You know, he's preaching and teaching. Uh, and he doesn't get angry with uh, all these friends for bringing this, this man and lowering him through the roof and all the disruption that happens. Uh, but as this man is lowered down in front of Jesus uses the first of our really key words uh, for today. He says to him, friend. He calls him friend. Wow. Being called friend by Jesus, that's, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? That's pretty big. You know, for us to be considered Jesus' friends, amazing uh, that that uh, is uh, something that is, is for us, each one of us, here this morning, um, to be Jesus' friend. And Jesus called this man friend. And then there's the surprise, because this man has been lowered down in front of Jesus. He can't walk. Jesus has been going around healing people. Uh, and so the expectation is that Jesus will heal this man as well. But Jesus says to him, friend, 
your sins are forgiven. Jesus looks into the man's heart. He sees his faith. He sees the person first. The disability is important, but what Jesus is more interested in is the person and that person's heart and faith. And he recognizes something really important uh, in that person. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now that causes a bit of a stir. There's a bit of a commotion. There are people in the room that aren't very happy about that. And, and Jesus uh, hears that and, and understands what's going on in the room around him. Uh, and so in order to demonstrate that he does indeed have the power to forgive sins, the, fin the sins of that man who was lowered down through the roof, and us as well, who he counts as friends too. He said to the man, stand, take up your mat and go. And the man's able to do that and he's healed and he's able to take his mat and walk. But the important teaching that Jesus gives us in that story is that he sees the person first and so should we. And when we encounter people with additional needs or disabilities, so often our narrative, our understanding of them uh, is based around the, uh, the disability. Uh, there's a, a, a phrase that sometimes gets used to uh, describe this. You might have heard it. It's called, does he take sugar? Some of you might have heard that phrase. Um, so often when somebody's uh, perhaps in a wheelchair or has another disability and they're with somebody else, a friend, a family member, there's somebody they're talking to at that, uh, at that moment and somebody's offering them a, a cup of tea or coffee and they'll talk to um, the, the person's friend or family member and ask, you know, does he take sugar? Um, just because the person's in a wheelchair doesn't mean uh, that they can't respond and, and, uh, and, and engage in those conversations. Seeing the person first is what Jesus was teaching us through that story. As we move on to our second story, this, this is probably my favorite story of all the encounters that Jesus had uh, with people uh, with disabilities and additional needs. And we shared a little bit about this uh, during our training yesterday, but it's the story of when Jesus meets Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, a man born blind who begged at the side of the road to Jericho. And Jesus is up and down that road with the disciples and followers quite often. And on this occasion, again, Jesus has been going around and he's been healing people and he's been teaching and he's been preaching. Uh, and he's coming along the road, and there's a big crowd of people uh, coming along with him. And Bartimaeus hears the commotion and asks, what's going on? What's happening? What's all this noise all about? And somebody explains to Bartimaeus that it's Jesus uh, and all of his disciples and followers that are going by. And so Bartimaeus shouts out, and he says, son of David, have mercy on me. Our key little word or phrase is that those words, son of David. Bartimaeus recognized Jesus for who he was. He knew who Jesus was, that he was the son of David, the one that was to come to be the savior of the world. And he shouted out, son of David, have mercy on me. And then what happened to Bartimaeus is what happens to a lot of people with additional needs and disabilities, uh, including sometimes, sadly, in our churches. Bartimaeus was told to be quiet, told to not be a nuisance and to stay out of the way and not to bother the master. But the more they tried to quieten Bartimaeus and tell him not to, uh, to be a nuisance, the more he shouted out and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus hears him and Bartimaeus is brought to him. And Bartimaeus, a man born blind, is there stood in front of Jesus. And this is where our next surprise comes along. Because there's a crowd that's gathered round. Jesus has been going round healing people. Bartimaeus, a man born blind, is in front of him. And everybody expects that Jesus will just heal him and then uh, all move on. But Jesus does something surprising, something unexpected. He asks Bartimaeus a question. He says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? The crowd must have been incredulous. They must have been wondering why on earth Jesus was asking Bartimaeus what he wanted. Surely he knew. 
And surely Jesus did. As a man, he must have known that Bartimaeus was, uh, was blind. He'd seen him begging at the side of the road. As God made flesh, he must have known what Bartimaeus wanted from him. But he didn't assume. He didn't decide on behalf of Bartimaeus. He asked Bartimaeus, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? And Bartimaeus said, I want to see. And of course, Jesus then did heal him. And as he healed him, and Bartimaeus was able to see again, Bartimaeus rejoiced and joined with the throng that was heading uh, along the road. There's a, another phrase that gets used quite a bit um, in the disability community, and it's nothing about me without me. Nothing about me without me. In other words, don't make decisions for me. Don't decide on my behalf what I need, but ask me, involve me, include me, help me to help you. And that's what Jesus was teaching us 2,000 years ago as he asked Bartimaeus that question. What would he like me to do for you? Jesus' third uh, encounter that we're going to uh, explore uh, together this morning was when he met a man who was deaf and who couldn't speak. Uh, and again, he'd been going around doing lots of preaching, teaching and healing, and uh, a man was brought to him, and there's a big crowd around again, and this man uh, has never been able to speak and has never been able to hear. Uh, and everybody gathers around again expecting uh, another uh, uh, miracle to happen. And the surprise that then happens is what Jesus does next. Because what Jesus does next is to take the man away from all of this throng to somewhere quieter, to somewhere more peaceful. And I think he does that for a number of reasons. I think first and foremost, he does it because he is respecting the dignity uh, of the person that he's engaging with. This isn't a freak show. This isn't something uh, that's entertainment for everything, everybody. This is something that's deeply personal, isn't it, for the man who he uh, is encountering here. And as he meets with this man in a quieter place, uh, and he, he, he starts to, to heal him, the, 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 the sort of word, uh, the, the, the key sort of point in all of this for me is, is when Jesus gives up a deep sigh and looks towards heaven and says, Ephatha, Ephatha, be opened. Now, I might be stretching things a bit too far, but I wonder sometimes when I read that story of Jesus taking this man to one side and, and of how he sighs deeply and looks to heaven and says, be open. It's almost as if he was taking the man's uh, inability to speak into his own body and dealing with it there and then sighing and speaking and as soon as he said be open the man was able to hear and he was able to speak I think also if that man had suddenly been able to hear for the first time in his life surrounded by hundreds maybe of people that were noisy and were boisterous it could have been overwhelming for him but in that quieter place was able to get used to being able to hear for the first time. Jesus understood that and respected him and showed him some dignity. I had a, 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 an encounter with a, a young ch a child who uh, couldn't speak at Spring Harvest a few years ago. Uh, one of my roles at Spring Harvest, I don't think it's going to be happening this year, unfortunately, but one of my roles at Spring Harvest is uh, to, uh, to oversee the sort of accessibility uh, across uh, the site, and that includes all the children's and youth work. And that means that I go around a couple of times a day at least to each of the children's sessions to check in on how they're doing and to uh, help, if I can, uh, to support any of the children and young people uh, with additional needs that are there. And uh, on this particular occasion, there was a, uh, a young lad who was um, probably about nine or ten uh, called Jack. Uh, and Jack uh, is autistic uh, and uh, is nonverbal. Uh, and he reminded me a lot of James when he was that age. Uh, and so I just watched what Jack was doing. And, and on this particular occasion, uh, Jack uh, was building a tower uh, out of wooden Jenga blocks. 
And he would build this tower about seven or eight blocks high, and then it would fall over, and then he would start again. I just wondered what he was doing and how that was linking in with what we were doing at Spring Harvest. But as I sat and watched him, bit by bit, he allowed me to join in with what he was doing. The blocks fell in my direction, and I was able to sort of move them back to where he was. And bit by bit, he invited me in, and, and I was able to help him build the tower. And we've discovered that by working together, we could build a much, much taller tower of maybe 20, 25 blocks high. And when it fell over then with a great big crash, I learned that Jack had a wonderful belly laugh. He roared with laughter uh, when this tower fell. And I spent far too much time uh, there, and I you know, neglected my other duties, and I was there just immersed in this moment with Jack. But eventually, I knew that I had to move on uh, and carry on on my rounds. And, uh, and as I left, I looked back at Jack, and I saw him there building his little stack of blocks again up to seven or eight blocks high, and then it would fall over. The belly laugh wasn't there. And I just wondered, it broke me. It absolutely broke me. What were we doing to help Jack? What were we doing to support him? What were we doing that was enabling him to, to, to get some sort of understanding of what Spring Harvest was all about and, and, and the gospel message uh, that was being uh, shared? Well, a few days after Spring Harvest finished, uh, I had a phone call uh, from Spring Harvest office. And they shared with me a story that had been relayed to them by Jack's parents. Because on the way home, Jack, this nonverbal autistic lad, had started to sing. And he'd been singing uh, the, uh, just three words from a worship song that they'd been using a lot uh, in their children's session that time. And he was singing the same three words over and over again, and they were three words from the song Cornerstone. And the three words that Jack was singing were weak made strong. Weak made strong. I got my answer about what was going on with Jack there. We may have not been engaging him as well as we could with the things that were happening, but God was there. And God was reaching into his life, and God was making a difference for Jack. Uh, and, jo and God was releasing his worship, uh, and, got, and Jack was able to sing those words, weak made strong. Let's go on to our fourth story. Our fourth story is Jesus' encounter with a man who had leprosy. Now, there are perhaps in some ways a few parallels that, that, that might be helpful for us as we think about uh, this man who, uh, because of leprosy, was isolated from his community. Um, he was outcast and he wasn't able to, uh, to engage with other members uh, of uh, the community, his family, his friends. It was very difficult. Jesus encountered him. This man came to Jesus and, he, and, and asked if Jesus was willing, would Jesus heal him. And the little phrase, the, the word or phrase that, that stands out from this story is when Jesus said, I am willing. I am willing. And Jesus then did the surprising thing. Because what he did was to reach out and to touch this man. And as he touched him, he healed him. But just imagine how countercultural that must have been. Uh, in that time. And, you know, we can uh, sort of get a, a, a tiny glimpse of that today as we worry about shaking hands or touching people or hugging people. In those days, um, to touch somebody with leprosy would have been absolutely the last thing that you would have done. But Jesus' response was to reach out to this man and touch him. I am willing, Jesus said. And I believe that as Jesus touched him, he healed him physically, but in that touch, he started the process of healing him mentally and emotionally as well, of being able to, to, to receive touch once more. Now, I'm, I'm not encouraging you here to, um, to find people with disabilities or additional needs and start to, to touch them. 
Uh, I'm reminded of what a friend of mine, Kay, says. Um, Kay, um, like me, uh, goes around with uh, some additional needs ministry work, uh, speaking to churches to help them to work with children and young people. Uh, she um, usually uses a wheelchair, uh, a powered wheelchair, and quite often she'll tell me about times that she gets to a church uh, and uh, somebody will uninvited come up to her, uh, and often it's a guy, um, put their hands on her legs and start praying for her. Now, I'm fairly sure that if I just randomly went up to a woman I'd never met before and put my hands on her legs, I'd probably get a slap <laughs> and would deserve it. Uh, but uh, for Kay, it seems that this happens uh, all too often. And the thing is that actually, uh, if they were to ask what she would like prayer for, if they were to ask that question that Jesus asked of Bartimaeus, you know, what could I do for you? She would say to them, actually, would you pray for my eyes? Because they really hurt at the moment. Uh, and uh, she would then be grateful for prayer for that. Um, so don't just randomly go up to a disabled person and touch them. But uh, be aware that sometimes people can be afraid uh, of disability. Sometimes there's a fear that's there, and that can mean uh, that disabled people can often uh, not have that encounter with people in the same way uh, as anybody else might. And, and actually, uh, there are appropriate times when invited or if asked um, for a hug or a touch uh, that can be really meaningful and really important. Remember Jesus' example. He was willing. Are we willing? He wasn't afraid. Are we afraid? I hope we're not. I hope we're not. Our final of our five stories uh, is uh, of Jesus' encounter uh, with a woman uh, who uh, had a condition that meant that she bled. And she'd had this condition for 12 years. And during those 12 years, that had meant that she had been uh, considered unclean. Uh, and she was on the margins of her society. And she hears Jesus going by. It's a, a little bit like a parallel with Bartimaeus' story. There's a commotion of people going by uh, with Jesus. And she realizes uh, that uh, Jesus is going by. And, uh, and she doesn't want to disturb Jesus. She, do, she doesn't feel that she is able to be able to, to ask Jesus to heal her. But she thinks that maybe if she could just touch his cloak. That might be enough. And as Jesus goes by, she reaches through the crowd and she touches his cloak. And immediately she knows that something amazing has happened and she's healed. And, and she hopes that she can just slip quietly away. And that nobody will notice and that nobody will know except her what's happened. But Jesus notices. Jesus knows that something significant has happened. Jesus knows that something, uh, that power has gone out uh, of her. And he stops and he says, who touched me? And the disciples say, well, what do you mean, who touched you? The people everywhere were all being jostled around. What do you mean, who touched you? Somebody touched me. I felt power go out of me. Jesus knew that it wasn't just an ordinary touch. It wasn't somebody knocking into him. This was something intentional. This was something significant. And he kept on and on. Who touched me? And the woman's there and, and she's feeling more and more self-conscious and more and more you know, just thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? This is you know, really, really difficult. And eventually she just feels compelled to, to, to come forward uh, and, and to say, it was me. It was me. She must have been terrified. And at first glance and at first reading of the story, maybe the surprise for us is, is that Jesus was doing that. And we think, well, isn't that a bit cruel for him to have pulled her out of the crowd and standing her there in front of everybody? Doesn't that appear a bit cruel? But Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew what he was doing. And, and the word from this passage uh, that stands out for me is the word daughter daughter she stood there in front of him trembling fearful what's going to happen and he reassures her he says daughter daughter and and as he 
sees the crowd around her. He says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. He is declaring her as the rabbi healed in front of her community. She can stand in front of her community as somebody now who is declared as healed, who is welcomed back into her community, who is able to engage with her community um, as she was before all this started 12 years ago. If she'd just snuck away when that healing had happened, would anybody have believed her? Would anybody have said to her when she said, I touched his robe and now I'm healed? Would anybody have accepted that? But by bringing her out and standing her there in front of everybody and saying, daughter, your faith has healed you. He was declaring her healed. He was declaring her included, welcomed back, belonging in her community. And our teaching from that is, is, is how we uh, should include and, 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 and create that belonging for everybody. Uh, and whether that means that we're, we're included and belonging as community in a place like this, or if over the next few weeks or months that means we're going to be included as part of a community and belonging online or whatever that looks like, so important that that includes everybody, isn't it? So in each of those stories, some key words that, that Jesus brought out for us, he called the man lower through the roof friend. He was given his title by Bartimaeus of son of David. There was that deep sigh and that word of Ephrathah, be opened, uh, as he healed the man who had never been able to speak or hear. He said to the man with leprosy, I am willing, I am willing. And he called the woman who had just been healed by a touch of his cloak, daughter. Jesus saw the person first. God, isn't it? Um, perhaps we can have the next slide. Uh, Jesus called, uh, saw the person first, not the disability. He didn't assume or decide on behalf of the people he met what they wanted. He asked them. He treated them with dignity and with respect. He wasn't afraid of disability. He embraced people that were disabled. And he included everyone and created belonging for everyone in that community that, that he was building and is still building today for each one of us. As we think about what that community looks like, uh, we're going to uh, just have a, a look at a brief little video. It's only a couple of minutes long. And in this video, uh, there's a bunch of people with a range of different additional needs and disabilities who are sharing the Apostles' Creed with us. Uh, maybe we can join in with the Amen at the end uh, and just think about the folk in our community uh, that uh, have additional needs and disabilities, whether they're here, whether they're at home and joining in uh, in other ways. Um, there's some great characters in this video. I particularly like the Pontius Pilate kid. You'll see what I mean when we get there, but perhaps we could have the video and then we'll pray afterwards.
Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Lord, we are so grateful for all that you teach us, for all that you show us, for the way of living that you modeled for us uh, so wonderfully, uh, and how you continue to work that out in each of our lives. And we thank you that uh, in, in every case, with every person you met, you, you saw into their heart, into their mind. You saw them as a person first. Uh, and we pray that you would help us to do that for each person uh, that we know and each person that we meet. Help, them, help us to see what you see. Help us to see um, into each person's heart and see them as a person first. Not to assume or decide for them what they need or want, but to ask. And especially in these hard times ahead, um, for us to look for those opportunities to ask each other how we can serve each other, how we can be you to each other how we can treat each other with that dignity and respect and, and to know that, that every one of us is, is part of, uh, of that community that you're building together and that, that you reach into uh, each of our lives. You touch us in really special ways. Help us to have um, that touch of love uh, and of peace and of joy um, for each one uh, of our community that we meet and help us all as maybe we're meeting in different ways over these next few weeks and months um, still to recognize that we belong to your family um, that we belong to you uh, and that you're still working uh, in each of our lives and that that however we're able to engage with each other and come together um, that that we're doing that in your name and with your blessing and that you are uh, touching each one of us uh, in the way uh, that you want to. So, Father, we thank you again for, for all that we've learned uh, through your word this morning, and we pray uh, your blessing uh, on us and on the remainder of our time together now. In Jesus' name, amen.